Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this final event for the SOAS Festival of Ideas on Decolonizing Knowledge. My name is Amina Yekin, and I'm the director of the festival. It's been a huge honor for me to have um, been able to work with an incredible team during this festival. We have had all sorts of conversations. We began on Monday, 19th October, with the opening program and a keynote lecture on decolonizing knowledge, the flow of knowledge in regards to the positioning of the Global South by the incoming SOAS director, Professor Adam Habib, and um, the vice, uh, he's the director of WITS at the moment. And we've had discussions and conversations that have really pushed things to the absolute limit with regards to what it means to be thinking about decolonizing when it comes to the issue of refugees and migrants what what can we are there other ways of how we might connect across cultures and when you know what, what is happening around the huge political debates of our times what happened this summer with the George Floyd's murder, the Black Lives Matter protests, and indeed um, we have been thinking and talking about these things and connected to them is the question of reparations, of statues, of slavery, of enslavement. We've talked about heritage and repatriation. And um, also with we've been um, mesmerized by oral storytelling and I've learned things from Haiti, from Haiti to the multilingual Mushaira in India and Pakistan. And it's been a incredible learning experience. I think it's without the creative input of masterclasses, this festival would not feel the same that it's been because we are talking about critical thinking in our panel discussions with our incredible researchers. So the festival has been led uh, very much by the theme of research, that it's very necessary for us in the world that we live in, in a kind of fake news world, that our thinking is research-led, that we still think critically, that we are not shut down by trolling and we don't feel that we can't talk about things that matter to us as um, the, the doors of... Um, the pandemic close down sources of funding and make make precarity a new norm for all of us. So that is, you know, those are the things that have been happening in the festival. The conversations have been many and I I'm really amazed by the work that colleagues are doing and also by the guest speakers who have generously given up their time to join us from across the world and um, I, I was just saying to this particular panel when uh, as we were starting that when we envisaged this festival originally it was going to happen in in May in in the institution at SOAS in a SOAS building and uh, from there it's gone to a virtual festival from a one day event to a six day packed series of conversations, talks, masterclasses, um, and all, and, you know, musical performances. It's just been incredible and phenomenal. And there are so many people to thank in who have helped to make this possible. And I must mention them because without them at the helm of this, none of this would have been possible. So I have to thank the incredible force that is uh, Stephanie Gourand. I don't know if she'll consent to showing her face, uh, but she really has been instrumental with regards to helping me put together the program in, in sort of bringing together speakers and reaching out and, and just keeping things ticking over. And along with Stephanie, there's Angelica Bachiera, without whom, of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to, to pay and to um, connect with a lot of uh, our speakers. Um, Angelica, thank you so much. Sunil, um, Sunil in the uh, Centers and Programs Office as well. Kumi, Danny, who've been helping with tech support. I mean, these guys really are doing this for some of them are doing this for the first time. So I am so grateful and so thankful. They are just 
incredible and, and the force of youth is behind us. Um, and I am also very grateful to SOAS Radio for their podcasts, to Fred and Miriam Francois for doing that, to Aki, to Jack in um, various places of the institution who've, who've kind of come forward at different points. And to, and to my colleagues who have taken part in the panels, supported the project, listened patiently to me and come forward with their ideas. And, and I must um, mention Alison Scott Bauman, Vania Hamzic, Ruba Saleh, Mira Sabranatham, the chair of the De former chair of the decolonizing working group from whom I've taken over without their support you know I, I would not be able to put this together and also Andrea Cornwall the pro-director for research it is my uh, great pleasure to hand over and, and I'm and I'm sure I've missed people in this kind of vote of thanks for which I apologize and I thank you all I thank all the attendees all the people who've joined the festival from all parts you've really made the festival uh, what it is. You've given it the spirit that it needed. And um, it, it, to be global at a time like this is, is, is so important and so valuable for us. Um, I think we've had an, a, a kind of challenging time at SOAS over the summer, and this festival has really been about what SOAS is about and can be. And we very much hope that this is the spirit that we will be taking forward with all of your support. So for tonight's event, I'm delighted. We've had several partners in, in the various events as well that we've been hosting. And um, Butcha Boulevard just did their performance. Thank you to them for an amazing performance of decolonizing, not just a buzzword, the Women's Resource Center for their work on CEDAW for, for funding a little bit of our work to Alex Lewis, who is no longer at SOAS, but who helped with some of the funding. And, and for this evening, to Wasafiri, to Malachi McIntosh uh, in particular, who we have been harassing since, I think, the first um, time that we were thinking about this. And we are so lucky this evening to have such an incredible range of writers with us. You are going to be in absolutely you know, amazing places and a conversation that will lighten up your well not lighten light up your saturday evening on race class and writing decolonizing the publishing industry i'm grateful to all on this panel and and a huge thanks to sushila from from sort of and, and to margaret who and to malachi and emma and jennifer i'm really looking forward to this so i will now hand over to the host for this evening Malachi, over to you. Thank you so much and a warm welcome to you all. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, welcome to, to our collective living rooms. My name is Malachi McIntosh, as Amina says. I'm the editor and publishing director of Lossy Theory, the magazine of international and contemporary writing. And I'm going to be your chair stroke host for the evening on this conversation about race class writing, decolonizing the publishing industry. Um, as I'm, I'm gonna just said, the program of the Festival Ideas over the past week has been um, vast, taking all sorts of different perspectives on all aspects of this question of decolonization. Um, and I'm hopeful that we act as a, a good end cap to, to the discussions, to the performances, to the workshops, to the dialogues, to everything that has happened thus far this week. Um, I think though, based on our panelists, certainly not on me, that you're in for a treat. Um, tonight's discussion will be uniting a range of perspectives across a range of different backgrounds and experiences within the publishing industry to reflect on this question of decolonization as necessity. Um, broadly in UK publishing, I think will be our main focus um, from a lot of different directions. Um, I'm joined by Margaret Busby, and, and I think almost everyone does, doesn't really need an introduction, but, but just in case. Um, Margaret Busby, a major cultural figure in Britain and around the world. Margaret was born in Ghana, educated in the UK, became Britain's youngest and first Black woman publisher when she co-founded Alison and Busby in the 1960s, and has published a range of notable authors from Butchi M. Chetta, to Rosa Guy, CLR James, um, and worked with almost every writer you've probably heard of, among them Toni Morrison and Ngudi Wa Dionga. 
Also with us today is Shishila Nasta, the founder of Wasafiri and the editor-in-chief of the magazine from 1984 to 2019. Shishila has published widely in a variety of genres, primarily in research on the South Asian diaspora, the Caribbean, and Black Britain. Her latest work, an anthology called Brave New Words, unites 15 of the world's leading writers to reflect on the power of writing now. Also with us is Emma Wallace, Senior Brand Manager from Murky Books, her award-winning publishing imprint, famously launched by Stormzy and Penguin Random House in 2018. She leads on all things related to the public image of Murky, from brand to social media management to community growth um, to initiatives and partner development. And by no means least, uh, at last but by no means least, Jennifer Wong, um, who's a poet and associate lecturer at Oxford Brookes University. She grew up in Hong Kong and lives in the UK. She's the author of several collections, including Goldfish and Diary of a Miu Miu Sales Girl. And her latest collection, Letters Home, explores complexities of history, migration, and translation. It's been a PBS Wildcard Choice by the Poetry Book Society and was highly commended in the 2020 Forward Prize. Um, we have unfortunately lost Edwidge Dantica, who we had hoped to join us today. Um, but because of scheduling issues and time zones, that ultimately wasn't possible. Um, but I'm, I'm feeling confident that, that we have the range of expertise to make this a productive discussion. Um, the structure of how we're going to proceed is we will have a conversation between the panelists, which will last somewhere in the range of 40 minutes to, to 50 minutes, and then afterwards have a Q&A. Um, I'm very used to doing these sorts of events in person, where now would be when I gave you sort of um, the housekeeping notes about where the bathroom is and what happens if there's a fire. Everyone's at home, so you probably know where the bathroom is. And, and if there's a fire, then, you know, as you would, leave the Zoom call and good luck from us. Um, there is, however, one uh, piece of housekeeping I need to give you for the virtual space, which is on the Q&A. Um, you'll see that there, there's a chat function, as you often have on Zoom which is a space just to have comments and discussions as the conversation rolls over. And there's also a separate Q&A space where uh, we'd like you to drop questions. So after the 50 minutes, roughly, of conversation between us, we'll switch over to Q&A. And um, rather than having to just turn on the cameras and everything else, having to balance sound and anything else like that, um, I'll go through the Q&A and select some questions to draw out. So please do drop questions in there as and when they uh, sort of occur to you over the course of of the evening of the conversation, um, and we'll turn to those in, in sort of the final segment of, of the conversation. Um, again, a very, very warm welcome from me um, uh, to this space that we're all sharing um, in the ether um, and to this conversation. Um, I wanted to kick off uh, by way of introduction to, to the panelists um, and getting our, our sort of our brains ticking over with just a question to each individual in the order that I introduced them. So Margaret, then Shishila, then Emma, then Jennifer, um, about roots into the literary world and, and how um, individuals have engaged with questions of race and class. So I just wanted to start, Margaret, with you. Um, and it's a question I'll ask to everyone. How did you find your way into sort of the literary sphere, as it were? And how have questions of race and class influenced your work within it? Well, I, I started um, my career in publishing when I was really very young. So I, I had no context really to judge how the industry was. And I guess also because it was back in the 60s, so there, were, there was a very different societal view. And I, I, was, I was very conscious of being a very unusual figure, if you like, in the industry in, in, in Britain. But it didn't impact on what I wanted to do because I was, I was um, too young to know what I should be doing or to know what the conventions were. So I, I was just doing what I wanted to do. And that gave me a certain sort of freedom to take on different writers, which writers who perhaps would not have been taken on by other publishers and who in a way transcended various traditional uh, barriers of race and class that, that publishing had been used to till then. Does that make sense? That, that makes perfect sense. And I guess, I guess switching back to that question of, of, of 
how race and class influenced your own work. You said you were an unusual figure. Um, I'm guessing that's kind of a, a nice way of saying your face is a kind of face that people weren't used to seeing. I mean, how did that affect the way that you approached your work besides kind of seeking out um, writers that have perhaps been overlooked by the mainstream? Well, as you said, I, I was the, the first uh, African, black African woman um, to head a publishing company, probably in this country. And I, I, at the time, I wasn't aware of that. I, I, it was only subsequent that I met actually the first uh, Caribbean black publisher, John LaRoche, who started New Beacon Books the year before I started. In 1966, he started. So it was people like John and later Jessica Huntley and, and other people in America. I, I met Tony Morrison, who was an editor with Random House. And it was by meeting those sorts of people in the industry that I realized that I was not alone as a black woman in the industry. Certainly within the mainstream, I, I can't think of any others I met in this country, but having autonomous companies like New Beacon Books and Bogle Louis Publications was a, a great support. And, and we, we did collaborate and work together. And also, it, it, when a magazine like What's the Fury came on the scene, that was something that kind of, it didn't necessarily validate what I was doing, but it was a support. We were all within the same area of what we were trying to do, the sorts of writers we were publishing, not the, 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 they, were, they were all black writers or all from the Caribbean or from Africa, but there was a certain openness of, of spirit and the imagination of, and, and things that we were coming across, things we were looking for because of our own perspectives, because we were not all coming from a perspective of being a, a, a white English middle-class person, which is, I suppose, at that time, what the industry was used to. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Shashila, this is probably a natural place to bring you into the conversation with the same question. Um, so you emerged, as Margaret said, out of the, at the same era um, of I guess the, the early movements of Black publishing in Britain through Alison Bus Busby, through um, New Beacon Books. Um, how did you sort of enter into the field and, and how have questions of race and class influenced your work? Shashila, do we have you? We, you're muted and we can't quite see you yet. Unmute, there we are. Um, I seem to be, there we are. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, I mean, I think in a way when um, I founded Wasa Theory, there were sort of lots of similar issues at play um, as, Mar as uh, Margaret's just described. I think I came from a slightly different angle. I suppose what motivated me in terms of founding the magazine and I'd never been an editor before, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, was was the fact that what I read at school had never really kind of spoken to me in terms of the kinds of characters I met in the novels I was reading in the sixth form and so on. And when I got to university and studied African and Caribbean literature and started reading people like Jean Rees and George Lanning and Sam Selvon and um, Nagugi and Achebe, I began to realize a whole different world and I got quite excited about it just on a purely literary level, not really so much to do with representation at that point. And, and then I moved into um, working in schools um, and became involved with an organization called ATCAL, which was the Association for the Teaching of Caribbean and African Literature. And so I kind of went into thinking about how one could change the curriculum, how one could um, create more books and create more readers and alert readers to to the kind of literature that was out there and 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 rather similarly um, again you know every literary party I went to and people said what are you working on and I was doing research at the time and I always used to say you know Sam Selvon and V.S. Naipaul and they didn't know who V.S. Naipaul was but usually people had no idea of the writers um, so I got passionate about creating a magazine that would bring these writers to the forefront and not just famous writers, writers that were little known and that might maybe be seriously reviewed, which they weren't being done, that wasn't happening in the mainstream press. So 
And in terms of race and class, I think it's always been central. It was one of the founding elements of Wasafiri um, to kind of counteract the orthodoxies of the mainstream publishing industry, which was simply not covering the kind of writing we wanted to cover. And it wasn't just to do with black writing, it was just to do with reading stories that were included in the whole canon. Um, and the canon, as it was at the time, was very narrowly defined. So the idea was really to expand things to tell not the other story, but to tell many stories at the same time and create dialogues across the world and across these different communities. And obviously art and politics, that's an old kernel and it's always there, but it's it still repeats itself. Um, and that's what motivated me, really. Thanks, Shishira. Um, I suppose we're fast forwarding a bit from, from the emergence of this field in the 60s into the 80s um, to your experience, Emma, um, including working with Murky Books, which you know I think most people on the call will know, was just founded very, very recently. So could you tell us a bit about your movement into the field and again, how you've engaged with those questions of race and class? Sure, yeah. Um, in my introduction kind of feels like I'm being introduced to a, a game show. Um, it's super hard following on from Shashila and, and Margaret because I've, I've only been in the publishing industry about four years now. Um, so speaking personally, I mean, publishing, uh, I don't know, I'd never really kind of thought of getting into the industry. Um, I still felt kind of like from the outside looking in um, that it was an industry that was built for sort of white middle class professionals. Um, and I actually, I'm, I'm a SOAS alumni, so I, I studied history at SOAS. And um, if you kind of told me that I'd, I'd end up where I am now after studying history at SOAS, I probably would have laughed um, in, in your face. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a bit of a weird journey. I, I, my background is digital marketing. I've worked in startups before. I worked at the BBC before Penguin. Um, and I kind of just stumbled into it. I know a lot of people say that. Um, but yeah, I guess right place, right time um, came into the industry. And then when I was in Penguin, Murky Books was launched uh, a couple of years later and um, the team was super small. And the sort of idea behind Murky was that it wasn't just, um, the focus wouldn't be just editorial, that there would there is a real need for, to cultivate a community of young, readers um, and aspiring writers who don't often see themselves represented within the pages of the book um, and they're out there but they're not engaging with um, a lot of the uh, traditional kind of publishing houses um, within Penguin at the moment so that's when I kind of moved across and brought um, my kind of experience working in digital marketing to, to Murky um, and in terms of Mechie books, I mean, our entire roster of authors is, is filled with black and brown authors, most of whom come from working class backgrounds. Um, I'll admit a lot of them are London based, and that's something that we do need to address as we move forward. Um, but the entire reason behind our existence is that Stormzy wanted to create a place where underrepresented writers could come um, and for their stories to not only be told, but also sort of heard and uplifted. Um, so it's my job to sort of reach that new generation of aspiring writers and readers um, and uh, sort of bring them together under the imprint. Um, so I lead on things like brand-led brand initiatives like our new writers prize, which is a competition for un unpublished underrepresented writers across the UK. Um, and the ultimate prize there is kind of a publishing contract with us at Mackie Books. Um, and we launched that last year and it's launched again this year, obviously not in the capacity that I would have hoped for because of COVID, but, um, you know, we, we move. Um, and the sort of kind of inspiration behind everything that we do with Mackie Books is to help um, people who don't feel that pu publishing industry is an attainable place to be um, and to help them to navigate and demystify this sort of landscape. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a real whiz through of how I kind of ended up where I am, which is basically stumbling and kind of finding my, myself at Murky Books. Thanks, Emma. Um, I mean, there are already some interesting parallels between the stories, not least, I think, as we move through time, the question of, you know, 
publishing feeling like something that is properly accessible and um, kind of pertains after 40, 50 years. Um, that's something we can come back to. Jenny, Jennifer, sorry, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, the same question about, uh, you know, how questions of race and class influence your work in the publishing industry, how you came into the industry. But of course, just wanted before you answer to flag the fact that you're coming from this from a very different perspective. So being a writer in Hong Kong, who's come to the UK first to study and, and then to establish uh, uh, your publishing career and teaching career as someone who's actively teaching creative writing. I, I just wondered if, if those things could, um, if you could touch on some of those things in your response as well. Um, hi, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Malachi. And um, um, really lovely to um, listen to um, what um, everyone has to talk about this um, subject. Um, I think um, for me, because um, I first came along to um, um, study um, uh, as an undergrad, I study English literature. And, and um, because uh, when I first started, um, it was the first time I came to England and um, I I have never been to England before, and I felt like a, quite an alienating experience as well as a very exciting experience. And I felt like because um, uh, I did my degree in um, uh, literature at Oxford back then, and probably because it was a long time ago, um, that the syllabus is totally, it's very, um, um, focused on um, a traditional or uh, British literature um, that is, and it, it, there's not much talk about diversity and so on. And um, I felt like um, very excited um, to, to, to come across so many, um, um, you, you know, like so many uh, such new knowledge and um, authors that I've always admired. But at the same time, I feel like I'm just so different from what I'm reading, what I was reading. And so I think, um, at that time, um, the, there wasn't really quite a, a, a desire for me to to write about my story. I was just really um, trying to appreciate that. And then the second time, um, like after I finished my degree and having worked in Hong Kong for a few years, um, I came back to England um, in 2008. Um, um, wanting to do a master's in creative writing and back then I chose um, to, um, to, to do that at UEA um, and I felt like it's such a, a different experience coming again to England and um, this time and um, working on creative writing and back then I had very little idea of what creative writing degree is supposed to lead to. I just thought that because I've been working uh, for a few years in marketing in Hong Kong and, and in government as well, um, it's time to do something that I really like. And I thought I would take it as more like a gap year. And um, But it, it, it's uh, certainly uh, as a person or as a, uh, like a creative writer, that made, makes a lot of difference to me. And it was like, um, because of the openness um, of um, the people um, at the, um, at, in my program and also the tutors, I realized that I can actually talk about my race or I can talk about my own version of story or history um, or about my um, migration experience um, in my uh, poetry. And I felt that's quite liberating. Um, but I think um, even though that, that um, at that point, that's how I felt. But um, I, I think it took me quite a long time to figure out, you know, the ways to, to, um, to, to kind of uh, work on it in my poetry, how to actually put it together, how to put to, together a collection on um, these stories or these narratives and um, to also figure out what I wanted to say, because I, I guess in terms of race, my understanding is like, quite um, um, ambivalent sometimes because um, I, I constantly um, seem to be moving between, um, do I feel like more like a person from Hong Kong or from, from China or Chinese culture, Chinese history, um, or, or um, am I currently, because I've um, lived so, so many years in England, do I feel like um, I'm a British um, or, or British immigrant um, in some ways? and. Uh, those labels um, continuously feel, make me feel like um, they are questions rather than answers in my poetry. But I feel like um, that's also, um, just to summarize, it's kind of where my uh, ideas for uh, Letters Home come from, like my latest poetry book. So I, 
I think like in a way it is um, all these accumulating together um, that kind of led me to want to explore this in, in greater depth in my, you know, in my poems and in my uh, latest collection. Thanks, Jennifer. Maybe if we can just bring everyone into the conversation at the stage. And um, Jennifer, I think what you said is perfectly sets up the next thing that I wanted to wanted to ask everyone because we have representatives um, in this group on the screen. Um, I guess again, a range of experience across across generations. And I think the natural thing that happens in these conversations around decolonization, especially around publishing is how much things have changed. And Jennifer, you kind of said, you know, in your experience, your first experience in the UK, you felt quite constrained and returning to UEA, it felt like things opened up a bit. So that's a kind of, you know, an arc of, of some sort of progress. Although I don't know if that's institutional. Um, and I just wanted to ask, and, you know, across the various places that folks are working, Shishila working at academia, Margaret sort of being a sort of front facing and publishing industry, kind of commissioning, editing art writers. Um, Emma sort of marketing now for Murky Books. Um, do you feel that perceptions of, of your own personal sort of race and class have affected the kind of work people expect you to make? I think everyone's touched on this a bit. And has that shifted over the course of your career? Um, and if so, in, in, in sort of what ways? And, and there's no need to an, answer sort of in series. I think it'd be great for us all to kind of speak together and respond to each other. And, and before people weigh in, just a reminder to, to the audience, please do drop any questions you have as they generate into the Q&A um, and we'll return to those. But yeah, how do, you, how do you feel perceptions have affected your work, the kind of work expected from you, the kind of work that you want to do? Um, and has that shifted over the course of your careers and how? Can I, 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 um, I think that perceptions certainly affected the way in which Wasafiri was seen. And, and I think it's kind of appropriate to mention the fact that it, Wasafiri was state funded at, at a certain point after going through lots of pockets of ethnic minority, so-called funding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the recent debate, I think, which many of you will have seen on Twitter the last few days between Martin and Amos and, um, you know, his piece in the Evening Standard, which was critiquing the Booker Prize, you know, and, you know, implying really that, you know, Bernadine Evaristo's shared win was somehow to do with cultural politics, which is such an old debate, um, is kind of relevant because in, you know, Wasafiri was constantly plagued by this every time we managed to get a review in a mainstream newspaper this issue would come up again and again and again and actually one of the major ones was in the TLS in 1990 in an article called Littleness in Literature and there'd been a, a show on at the South Bank of Little Magazines and I won't name the reviewer but the reviewer wrote a piece about these little magazines and then he started commenting on a recent round of Arts Council funding, which for us was the first time we'd been seen as a mainstream Arts Council client, which was a big move. And he basically just said, you know, the star revolutionaries of today are the feminist artists, the black artists, demanding attention as much by their political condition as their work, you know, and that goes on and on and on. And it seems to be happening, happened this week indeed. Um, so in terms of perceptions, I think, one thing I found really difficult was this battle about I'm not only publishing Black and Asian and diasporic literature, I'm publishing good writing from everywhere, but we are prioritizing that as well, because that kind of writing hasn't been seen as much as it ought to be, but it was simply to do with quality. And I know it's been a kind of problem, and, and more recently in my own work, when I've been proposing my book, The Bloomsbury Indians, to publishers, and they find out what it's about, they say, why don't you write a book about Ian Forster's Indian friends rather than the Bloomsbury Indians? So you can see the kind of shift, and, and I know this debate will go on later in terms of education, but it's, it's changing ways of thinking, which seems to be very, very difficult. So however many initiatives we have, it seems very hard to shift it. Thanks, Shishira. Any, any other thoughts? Emma, you reach a to unmute. Okay. Well, 
I can't really talk about publishing because I'm no longer, if you like, in the publishing industry. But I think one of the, the ways I see that things haven't changed so much is, is through the fact that, well, it is a kind of publishing. In fact, I, I, I edited two anthologies. The first one, Daughters of Africa, came out in 1992, and New Daughters of Africa came out in 2019. Now, when the first volume was being put together, I was very aware of the fact that people assumed there were just a handful of African women writers or women of African descent. And those are the high profile names that, that everybody would always focus on without you know, giving any credence to the fact that there were hundreds of other writers who could have been given attention. And sadly, the same thing is true in the 21st century, that there are a handful of high profile African women writers or women of African descent, and the others are sort of also ran. And I've heard as recently as last year, writers saying, well, we were going to have a feature in such and such a national paper on, on, on this particular writer who was a, you know, an African Muslim writer, but she was told that we already had one last week, so we can't do another one. So it's as if one has to represent all. In fact, there's a, in, in New Dolls of Africa, there's, there's a, 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 an essay by Leslie Eloko who talks about having a discussion with her publisher who was trying to persuade her she shouldn't have more than three African, three black characters. So there is that feeling still that, you know, one person has to represent the whole of a, a ethnicity or, or whatever it is. And, and I'm not sure whether that has changed enough yet because it still seems to me that people see diverse literature as some sort of anomaly. And the, the norm is to have you know, no black people, no brown people, no working class people. So I think that is still something that we need to find a way to change. I don't think Oh, sorry, sorry Malachi. No, 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 please go on. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think that's something we're very wary of at Murky Books. Um, I think we're, we're wary of becoming a place where um, sort of, uh, you know, black and brown writers are, are put and it kind of uh, devolves the other publishing houses and imprints of responsibility of, of, of um, having uh, more writers of, of colour and, and of different uh, backgrounds on, on their own sort of rosters. Um, and I think that kind of leads into a point I wanted to make around um, the not often having the space to fail in the publishing industry. I think um, we're, we're quite lucky at Murky Books and I'm quite lucky at Murky Books in that we're, we're new, there's eyes on us. We're, we're currently given the space to experiment and try things out. Um, but whether we're <clears throat> sorry, whether we're also given the space to fail, like so many other imprints were when they were first put together, is yet to be determined. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that you know how how long we'll be able to sort of have that space to experiment and to grow and to to bring more writers under the imprint um, in the way that we are before we kind of ask you know that that commercial vi viability kind of question where um, you know obviously. Uh, I feel like when it comes to commercial viability, black and brown writers on um, or, or uh, writers of different backgrounds and uh, underrepresented writers in general aren't really afforded a, a level playing field compared to um, the kind of usual, usual stereotypical writers that come through. Um, but yeah, that's just wanted to raise that. My, my two cents I was going to slide in is just um, the, the things that had been said sort of reminded me of uh, the response to the, the Booker Prize list that we have at the moment when there were several sort of hot takes of people coming in and, and doing the same grumbles about, you know, it's, it's where, where the young male white writers is one, of, one in particular, um, the implication that people are being edged out, that it was, um, as some people have said about the joint Booker Prize win last year, that it was just a sort of performative political thing. Um, and, you know, the quality writers were, were kind of elsewhere um, or being overlooked in favor of this sort of gestural political stuff. I wanna get back to the kind of political issues, but I do wanna bring into the conversation questions of class, which are sort of foregrounded in the title 
Um, because Emma, I think you sort of pointed to this in the very beginning where you said, you know, at Murky, we have mainly London-based authors and that's something that we're thinking about. Obviously in Britain at the moment, lots of conversations about class are, are beginning to engage with this question of North-South divides, of white working class opportunities across fields, but also in the arts has, has been sort of rising as, as a kind of topic of editorials and, and complaints and things like that. And Jennifer, when I first asked you to, what your thoughts were about how kind of race and class affected your output or what you felt like you could write, you sort of responded um, firstly by saying you wanted to read something, which is wonderful. It would be great to do that. Um, but responded thinking about how both in your case, you feel like both things sort of intersect and overlap. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Malika. Um, I, yes, I agree. Like, I think sometimes um, race and class uh, have this interception as well. And so one thing sort of um, kind of uh, converges with another. And um, for example, when I came, um, uh, for myself, um, I, I, uh, in writing these poems, I tend to have, like, um, I struggle a lot with the question of class because um, I wasn't sure, what, I am still not very sure what class I'm in because um, for a very long time, I think um, um, I, I've always assumed that I'm sort of working class or from a working class family because we, we've always, you know, been very pragmatic with whatever, uh, like the values and, and the thing is like um, creative writing in my family, they always, always suspected creative writing and publishing as something that only is only for the higher or you know like high higher classes in the society and they think that you know you uh, um, as a Chinese person you know and as a, an immigrant you know why should you be you know writing anything at all or, or try not to you know get too invested in that area and I think um, that's um, why I also for example uh, in my book um, I write about my father because um, he he has this sense that um, he works as a hotel manager and um, hotel uh, food and beverage manager, um, kind of looking after some um, the dining facilities. Um, but we we feel that like you know there's um, in, in Chinese society there's always this glory of like uh, working very hard, and they think like. Um, it is, um, you know, uh, the sort of education that I later on or uh, get involved in, or even um, the kind of get the work in academia. To them, it's a very distant dream, and um, especially for those uh, immigrants. And I think there is a connection to it. So, um, shall I read uh, a bit of from that? Um, yes, please. Sir. Um, my father, who taught me how to fold Soviet penguins. I was eight or nine when I saw you practice folding serviette penguins. For a long time, Christmas was a matter of watching fireworks on television, mother trying not to let her feelings show. And those evenings you came home, too tired to speak, 13 hours of pacing around dining rooms, impeccable cutlery, well ironed table linen, other families, happiness under the chandeliers. That's what work is, has been for you since you turned 18. And for all the fathers in the golden 80s, it's been a hard day's night. A husband must provide as long as he is alive. I try to think about who you really were, a schoolboy before duty, your father who never offered your mother a kind word, a kiss, but he kept a white shiny statue of Mao long after the couch was over. You never finished high school because your father said as you couldn't, he couldn't tolerate the idea of excessive schooling, a sign of moral corruption or sighting. The day I was accepted for the school on one Jordan road where the school drive glittered with Mercedes, we knew we were moving beyond our leak. And yet, and yet it suddenly seemed as if something was brightening again in you, something that has nothing to do with table napkins. Um, I think, although this, actually this poem um, was about my dad and he, he works in Hong Kong, but, uh, but still I think like this is pretty much something that is relevant to um, immigrants in England and lots of immigrant families, what they struggle with and how they perceive race and class. Um, so. 
Thanks, Jonathan. Um, and I think that brings into the conversation, and, and everyone please mute, we don't have to be so polite anymore, we can, we can unmute that is, um, we don't have to be so polite anymore, we can, we can talk over each other and respond to each other and so on for the time that we have left, but um, that uh, line about moving beyond our league, uh, Jennifer, I think speaks really well to everything that has been mentioned so far, uh, certainly on the publishing side, the idea that we only have space for one person the idea that you know we can only have a handful of people in in play at one time who are the leaders in the fields, um, and those leaders, in some level, have to present in a certain kind of way. You know, almost like the Michelle Obamas of British publishing. Like that's what's expected. You, you can't necessarily perform your identity in any other kind of way. Um, you know, the idea which comes out in report after report after report, the most recent being rethinking diversity in publishing about quality. The assumption that you know these works aren't good enough or you know, very few writers of color will be writing, writing to that, to the level necessary in order to publish. And, um, you know, this idea of there being a league and or two speeds and writers of color are here and others are, are there. I just wonder, I mean, across a varieties of different experience, there has been some change, there has been some, some failure to change. Um, we have a question in, oh, two questions now. We have one question, which is kind of, kind of gesturing towards this, but, I mean, how are these ideas overthrown or, 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 or can they be? So all of these stereotypical assumptions um, uh, in the industry about, about what's possible, about who should be doing what, is, it the, is the best way forward you know, doing independent initiatives? Um, is the thing about empowering writers to, to feel they're capable of participating? Um, is it about kind of Cultivate, cultivating again sort of alternative spaces as what the theory was. I mean, how have you seen effective resistance to, to these stereotypes kind of orchestrated? I think, I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose I feel it, it goes back always to education and what you read. So I think, you know, uh, I think Blake Morrison famously said at one point, you know, your your book shelves become your book selves. And in a way, the publishers, their book shelves also become their book selves. So what are they reading? Where are they going to university? What's happening with the curriculum? Um, for me, you know, literally going to Kent was a complete eye opener in terms of reading a diversity of writers. And I know a lot of university syllabuses have now changed, um, but schools sadly um, are lagging behind. And in the eighties, when Wasa Theory started, in fact, a lot was going on in schools um, and people were beginning, beginning to shift and change the way they saw things. But I think unless at a very fundamental level, people see this writing alongside as part of the education so they're not doing it as other writing as it was called in the GCSE we're not going to change anything it's always going to be oh that ethnic minority magazine or oh, that black writer it's, it's always going to be that um, and I don't see any other way of changing it other than through education um, and through changing the way people think at quite a fundamental level and I don't know how we achieve that because we've been trying to do it for ages but that's how I feel about it I, th I think it's also important to encourage uh, a wider range of people to be involved in the industry at every level. I mean, on this panel, we've got people who are editors, writers, publishers, and I think we need to broaden that so that the focus isn't as it quite often is on the writing and the, getting the writers published. We also need to be the publishers publishing the writers. And you know the reviewers reviewing the writers, so that it's from a variety of perspectives. We're not we're not being reviewed by somebody who thinks they're doing us a favor or being politically correct or whatever. We are representing ourselves as well as the the wider literary field. So I, I think that is important that we try and encourage other people that, to think that publishing, editing, all the other levels of the industry are possibilities for them too. I agree with that, yeah, wholeheartedly. Um, the education bit as well is obviously super, super important, but in terms of inside publishing, um, 
I think I've seen quite a bit of change only within our the publishing house that Murky Books is in, in the short time that we've been around, just by having our editor, Lamara Lindsay Prince, in the room when it comes to acquisition meetings, myself in the room when it comes to talking about the marketing, publicity, promotional stage of the book, um, in both of us in the room when it comes to talking about, you know, to the sales teams about where, you know, the sales reps go off and pitch certain books from the publishing house in, in general. Um, that's where I've started to see a, a little bit of, of, of a shift within our own sort of like immediate kind of uh, environment um, at Mikey Books. I think that's super important that um, that's kind of translated more widely across uh, other publishing houses, other publishing companies, the industry as a whole, because um, it's yeah at, at each sort of key stage um, within the within the sort of overall structure of the industry that that you find that you're kind of is working actively against the books that uh, a lot of the time people don't feel that don't fit into the stereotypical um sort of purchase from a reader um so yeah I, I think that's super important as well I wonder I mean I think maybe some of the the folks on the call might be in agreement with that, those statements it's necessary to sort of penetrate all levels of the organization um but I wonder too if there's you know the evidence on that front is is also slightly troubling so we have a the publishing industry itself is, is, is famously unrepresentative of, of Britain um, at any level across race or class, um, even region again. Um, but in addition for all the schemes to get junior editors and interns and so on of diverse backgrounds of color into publishing industry, very few of those have turned into permanent positions. So I, I guess the question to, to everyone is, why do you think that is? And, and you know, how, how could that be addressed? Because it sounds like it needs to be addressed in order to make these changes so good. Um, salary is a big sort of barrier to entry, I think. Um, it's uh, notoriously low and coming from outside the industry uh, just over four years ago, I kind of experienced that firsthand. But yeah, it's um, it, it really cuts out a lot of people that, that just won't be able to take that job or, or, or get their foot into the industry because they don't have a place to stay in London they can't afford rent here they you know there's no there's no office up north there's you know they it's just not affordable um, and not realistic so th therefore it's just like you're you're creating a, a whole industry of a certain type of person who can afford to work in it um I think that's a massive barrier the solution on that front is higher salaries or starting salaries. I, higher salaries, which yes. again, with yeah, I, I again, I've, I've only been working in the industry for four years, and it's been a constant discussion throughout those four years. So I can't imagine how long it's been going on before that. Um, but yeah, don't know how to fix that one, unfortunately. But I think we have to also see that there are a new ways of publishing, new technologies, online publishing. So I think we can see that as a way that. Uh, people can access, can, can influence perhaps what is made available and what is published, even if it's not in, in the same form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, then, also, sorry. Okay. sorry no, please, sure. No, okay. but also returning to some of the things that I guess Margaret and I lived through and, and, and are happening again now with independent, independent publishers, bookshops, collectives, collaborations, through the internet, through digital publishing, um, which kind of sidestep um, some of the gatekeepers, I guess, that are still, or the gates that aren't open yet, even though we want them to be, yeah. And I wonder, I mean, um, so Jennifer, you're published by an independent, not just press, um, local in the Midlands, um, a great publish, poetry publisher, just a shout out to them, um, for sort of finding underrepresented voices. But I wonder to what extent, and, and maybe um, everyone can weigh on in on this, those sort of alternative spaces for publication and promotion are able to lead to longevity. So I think Emma, were you saying, you know, uh, will people ha get, will you get at Murky Books as much of an opportunity to fail as other imprints? Um, is the independent route a way to kind of a secure hold in, in, in publishing? I know Margaret, she would have seen many careers sort of rise and, and, and fade. 
Um, is there a way to transmute that into, you know, lasting success, broader represent, broader recognition? Is it the case? I think many young writers think, you know, the way to, to get established is necessarily to go to the biggest possible house. I mean, how, how do these things function? Who's, who's that a yeah. question for? It's a question for everyone, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I mean, so the first question, I guess, is a natural place to shift into the Q&A that's been through, is um, someone wrote, I get a sense that it's easier to get into the publishing industry um, as an editor, but I think this counts for writers as well, by, quote, doing your own thing, setting up your own magazine or publication, for example. I've heard this many times from people. Would you give that advice to expiring editors, especially people of color who may not have the necessary connections? Um, and this is a conversation that is always going on in this space of decolonization, I think. So in the university sphere, there's Melza Lusu who set up the Free Black University are trying to saying that universities can't be reformed from inside. We need to go to alternative spaces. Um, we've just said that, you know, maybe we should think about alternative venues. Now there are more options on the internet and so on. Um, but I suppose the, the, the unspoken question often is, you know, is that a way to a thriving career? Can it be? How does one sort of turn that alternative publication into the sort of lasting space within the literary sphere, either as an editor or, or as, as, as an artist. And I, I guess that was just my question to everybody. I, I think it's important to say that being an editor, being in the edit editorial department is not the only way into publishing. Mm -hmm. Publishing has a lot of different segments, of, you know, whether it's the rights department, sales department, publicity department. So there are ways to utilize whichever skills you have to get into the industry and probably the editorial department may be the hardest department to get into so i think looking at other ways other aspects of the, the skills you have as, as a way to lead you in the industry is well worth considering if, if you know and following up if you like Jennifer. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, I just also wanted to mention maybe like in, maybe from my area, like in terms of people trying to work on more reviews or, or put, put out more like um, um, articles or, um, you know, wh whatever like um, that they can contribute. Um, sometimes it, it might take a while for, for um, a writer of color to, to kind of discover what, what exactly is the best way to capture the publisher's attention or what, what suits the you know what what will be uh, possible to publish but you know I, I think it's just like the willingness I mean just to kind of like test it out test out the waters but at the same time I agree like you know we really need to what we need is really like a more diverse taste and and not to kind of assume that all the writers are the same, even if they are just writers of color, they are all very diverse and there is market for all, of, you know, a, a wide range of them. And this doesn't mean that, you know, just like a publisher has taken one and, and that's already enough to kind of cover the racial, you know, diversity. Thank you all. Jennifer, I wondered if you could talk a bit about being published by independent publisher. Um, and how that has been and, and what that has sort of enabled for you as a writer. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, I feel that um, it's really um, lovely to be published by an independent publisher. Um, like an iron artist is very, um, you know, they're very sensitive to, to, the, to the work that I produce and uh, give me a lot of freedom to, to kind of um, explore what I wanted to say, say or put in in the collection. And I think um, that sort of um, willingness to sort of um, um, give license to the writer, to, to um, the permission, it's very important. And um, I, I think um, it, it, it is not easy to, 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 to pitch a collection to, to publishers. Um, and it does take it, it, it did take me quite a while but I um I think ultimately I'm really happy with the way that is produced and especially because um I'm trying really hard to not to over exoticize or not to exoticize at all like the idea of um, race and and I don't want it to be like a book about race like it, it's not really a book about race it's just about my story and um and and I wanted and 
I wanted the editors to kind of appreciate and try to understand that. And I think Jane has been really helpful in sort of showing that understanding and, um, you know, and going through the sort of um, editorial changes that is needed because very often, because I came uh, with a, you know, English is not my first language. So um, sometimes it can be really like, um, it needs a process in order to, to make, make it really work and speak to the English speaking reader or readership. Mm -hmm. So in your case, that did give you the space to sort of explore things, flourish, have support and I think it so, does, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think she, um, the, the publisher has been quite understanding. But on the other hand, I do appreciate that it's not always happening like that. And mm -hmm. sometimes you also need to assert what is really like, um, what is the thing that we have the right as a, as a writer, what is the right? So I, I mean, I have also in publishing maybe other book reviews, like um, some editors have been, you know, like, they just try to correct almost all like and the, your entire review. And I sometimes wonder if that's, it's because they think that I'm from a different background or, or is that just for perfection sake? So mm -hmm. sometimes it can be hard to tell. Um, I think I should, lots of questions are starting to come through. Um, so I think I should get a few questions in as time runs away with us a little while. Um, we've got, hmm, I, I, don't, I don't want to filter too much. Um, a question, mainly a question for Emma and Margaret. Um, so on the, on, on the issue of independent publishing, um, do you have tips for setting up your own publishing um, endeavor uh, dedicated to publishing black writers? Is that a viable business idea? How does one go about it? You go ahead, Emma. <laughs> I was just about to say, you can take that, Margaret. <laughs> no, um, when I started, I, I, I was so young, I didn't really know what I was doing. So I mean, I, I, all I can say is if I could do it straight out of university, anybody could do it. <laughs> but it was, it was a question of doing, you know, following what you believe in. We, we had very little money. We had lots of ideals. And in fact, it wasn't, when I started out in Busby with, with my, my partner, Clive Allison, it, it wasn't only black books we were publishing. We were publishing books we wanted to publish, which we thought were good books, or we were bringing books back into print that were out of print, whether it was you know, George Lamming or C.L.R. James. But we were publishing a wide range of books and we, we had a lot of energy. So it was our own energy that drove things rather than having much money. You know, we were working, you know, almost 24 hours a day and we were we were doing things in, in, in a way it's what happens with with in, independent small independent publishers now they put a lot of effort into everything they do because they, they haven't got the money that the large conglomerates have so I think you have to be prepared to work hard it's not easy but it's very rewarding so you know I would say do it but um, there's no shortcuts to just putting a lot of energy and belief into what you're doing and, and phoning up people like Emma asking her advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely agree. I, I think um, there's a lot to, to be learned from, from going independent as well. So our, just for, for an example, our now commissioning editor, she started out, um, she uh, published her own magazine called Planting Papers. Um, and that's how she kind of learned her process when it came to the editorial side of the work and she came into to murky books i think it's i think it's just been a year now but she obviously had to learn on the go um the sort of structures of the publishing industry but she had that base knowledge from doing her own thing and she had the connections and she could she basically got off the ground running and she, she's an amazing individual and i can't praise her enough but she she got that from doing her own thing first and i think there's a lot to be said from that and obviously she has she's spoken to me about the failures that she's had, but she's learned from them and learned from them quite quickly as well. Um, and you only have to look at publishers like Roundtable, Nights Of, and see the amazing things that they're doing. And uh, I mean, they've, they've done an amazing amount of hard work, and, but they've, they've got to where they are now and, and they're um, you know, out there and, and one of the best in, in children's publishing at the moment. And um, yeah, I, I definitely encourage sort of uh, more independent coming 
Thank you both. Um, it looks like most of the questions, quite a few questions coming through now. Um, and please, everyone, do, do send, them, send more as you have them. Um, are about practicalities. And I wonder if that's just because people accept that the industry is the industry. Um, and the question is really, how do we, how do we engage with it as, as it is? Um, almost the flip side of the question that we was just asked about setting up independence um, in print yourself is, uh, as a writer, if I don't manage to find an agent who understands the value of and readership that exists for my work, how can I get my writing to readers besides self-publishing? I guess it depends which publishers, I mean, you're talking about, because obviously it's a huge field and uh, I guess somewhere like Wasatiri or maybe Murky Books or some of the smaller publishers would may look at something, whereas a mainstream publisher maybe wouldn't. But I, I think literary prizes actually have quite a, and small literary prizes have quite a big part to play as well in terms of, not that I particularly like prize culture and, and people winning and comparing and so on, but it actually does promote the names of writers who are up and coming, particularly new prizes. Um, and then that hopefully gets them to the notice of agents and to perhaps to a publishing deal. Um, Um, was that a, that was a, an, yeah the agent question as well um I'd encourage you to slide in people's dms on on social media I mean I, I feel like uh, you know you, you don't ask you don't get and I, I welcome you to email us at, at murky books is also we can't publish everyone but we try to sort of in make the introductions to agents that we work with and we value and and have relationships with um to, to writers so you're very welcome to 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 get in contact with us and and we can help where we can but yeah i i definitely there's so many agents now on on social media um and authors most of the time kind of shout out their agents on on social media as well and you can kind of get a feel for kind of which writer your voice is similar to or your project is similar to or um you have similarities with um, and you can, I don't know, I'd, I, I would personally go and find their kind of agents and, and just, yeah, just tweet and get in touch with as many people as I can. But this perennial question is, is it necessary to have an agent to, to sort of make your way through? Have an agent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, pub publishers usually prefer to take on books that come via an agent, unless you happen to know the publisher personally or an editor personally. And I think it's, it's partly because they, they, they get so many submissions and, and also it's a sort of way of filtering out things that are, you know, hopeless or, or totally unsuitable for that particular publisher, I suppose. So it certainly can be as hard to find the right agent. And there are more agents some who at the moment are probably focusing on a greater diversity of, of writing than, than there were before. But I, I think it, it's, it's, it's a good discipline to try and submit your work to an agent and see what the submission, because agents have submissions policies. They normally say, send me the first three chapters or something. So you need to take look at it from the point of view of the publisher. They're getting, well, when I was a publisher, I was getting 50 titles, 50 submissions a week, and I wasn't even publishing 50 a year. So what is going to make any particular submission, any particular manuscript stand out from the others? You have to look at it from that perspective. You know, they cannot just reply or, or acknowledge sometimes every submission they get. So an agent is a good way to, to, to start and, and, and to focus on what it is you're trying to do. But I, I think also it's a question of don't stop writing. The fact that you can get your first book easily published doesn't mean to say you have to stop writing and, and wait for that to happen just keep writing and reading I also wanted to mention for example like as a writer um, uh, building a portfolio is also important I guess um, you know on one hand it's really important to find a good agent a good publisher to get your work out but I think um, uh, many writers sometimes they kind of 
forgot that um, it's important to kind of like there's a process like you need to kind of build up a really good portfolio have a really great idea of a book and um, the, the proposal and the, the, the sample chapters and all these and I think it's really important to invest time in that as well and to think like why your story is really important. There are a couple of questions which have come through and I think we might want to kind of turn the conversation back to bigger structural issues, which certainly may be slightly rhetorical. So someone said, do we need more, in order to have more working class voices and voices outside of London, do you think it'd be good to have offices for publishing houses outside of the North? Um, two people have asked, outside of, sorry, the South, so in the North, two people have asked, um, do we need more black publishers to get diverse writing to readers? Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to chime in on those questions, but I have a feeling, uh, yeah, I, I won't put words in the mouth, but I don't know if anyone had any additional thoughts. Well, you certainly need more black publishers. That, that's, that's, you know, there's no question about that because, and, and we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily talking about independent autonomous black publishers. We're talking about people within the industry, whether they are, black or, or of other ethnicities or other backgrounds, just to make the industry less of a clique, if you like. I, I think that has been the, the problem so far. So I, I think if there are any ways to get the industry more representative of society, I think that's that's what we have to see it as. It's, it's not simply, and, and there, are, there are, as we talked about, the challenges there are, whether it's to do with salaries or, or or such like to getting in, but I, I think one shouldn't give up on it, and one has to remember that there are that there are associated fields that one can be involved with. I mean, working in a bookshop stands you in, in good stead for working in the publishing industry, for example, or anything to do with books is is a good thing to have in your CV if you're trying to get into the industry. Thank you, Michael. Um, I want to change tack a little bit and consolidate a few questions that have come through. Um, and that are a bit more structural. So it seems like something that has been a sea change, not least this year, but probably from before this year, in opportunities being created for working class writers, also writers of color um, within British publishing in particular. The question is, is that a trend in, in your eyes? Um, and is there a way, if it feels like a trend, to stop it from being one? So. There was a lot of questioning around publishers coming forward and saying, you know, this kind of, we need to listen phrases that are published and we need to do this and that, lots of initiatives that have been put forward. And um, I have a SOC subscription that's not quite aligned. Um, it's a bit of a weird thing, but the company that I get socks from sent a Black Lives Matter um, email to everyone saying we need to do better. Um, it just seemed like the thing that was happening. Um, so in publishing, you know, is this a sea change that we're watching? Is this just gestural? And how, if it is necessary to decolonize publishing, do we make sure that this change lasts? And I know Tishili already talked about education, but sort of practically, the 70 odd people on, on this call, um, all probably from very, a variety of different backgrounds. And what can be done to sustain this? Is it a trend? What can we do to, to make it not a trend, if so? I don't have an answer. <laughs> is anybody else? <laughs> Million dollar question. I've sort of it? seen these trends before. I mean, that, so in a way that is an answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think in, in a way it's to do with finance because the industry as it stands will do some, will do whatever it can if it's, if it's actually profiting from it. I, I think we can see how um, this year that there, there have been books that have reach the top of the bestseller list because everybody's been talking about it. And I think if that can be seen as something that's gonna happen more often, then I think we will see that there's more sustainability in, in that area. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, in a way, we should have had some of those publishers on this panel to answer that question. <laughs> but uh, it sounds like Margaret is saying it's about dollars and cents. So if the books aren't selling, they're not gonna get picked up 
so perhaps the call there is for everyone to support the writers that they see kind of coming out, something like that. But is that enough? And it surely looks like you might be shaking your head. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think there's two things I'd say. One is, I, mean, I suppose it goes back, and I am going to go back to education a bit, but it, it's to do mm. with the people in publishing having more of a sense of history, the longer histories of the writing. So it's not just a new kid on the block, you know, that's being promoted um, and maybe the first two novels and then they disappear. Then the writers disappear and the books go out of print and you, you know, and you, you're trying to teach something or find a book by somebody and you can't even find it. Um, so you need to sustain a writer's career if they're a promising writer more than their first two novels or first two collections of poetry or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, the whole issue, it goes back to the whole class thing, but the whole thing about how do you assess quality? You know, who, who's writing the books? Who are they for? And who's reading them? You know, um, how do you assess that quality? And how do you try and create a, a culture within, whether it's mainstream or, or black publishing, you know, actually as well, which can also get quite narrow in its perspectives. Um, how do you change a culture which is actually genuinely um, going to, to kind of include a breadth of writing and not make these value judgments all the time, which are based on assumptions. I mean, one story, you know, which, you know, I often recite is, you know, Sam Selvon's The Lonely Londoners. When people actually saw Sam on stage speaking standard English, it's, it's written for those who don't know in a kind of literary vernacular and it's a classic novel of Black London. Um, they couldn't believe he actually spoke standard English and that he wasn't working class in the way that they assumed that he was because he'd adopted the voice in his novel. So, you know, there are those assumptions and there was that whole debate when, you know, um, Jim Kelman's book came out um, a long time ago around it not being proper English. So how do you decide what proper English is? Sorry, yeah. I've probably gone off, but you no, know, no, 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 it's, it's, it's about who's doing the deciding. It's about who's, who's making deciding. those decisions. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose I feel I feel a bit of responsibility has been the last um, uh, part of the the decolonizing sort of festival of ideas. But I mean, from the questions that have come in and and sort of the various the way the conversation has has flowed to an extent, it always seems that in this field of how do I change this industry? How do I change the university? How do I make this place more um, accepting? There is a fundamental confrontation of the very small individual versus the very massive edifice which predates them by hundreds of years. So Shishila, your question was, how do we change this culture? Um, and to change a culture always seems like a, a very, very big thing. Um, so I just wondered, I wanna push a little bit further. So to the people on the call and beyond, the people who they'll speak to about this panel, um, on the question of publishing, I mean, what is something that you think, what is a recommendation you can make to an individual to shift this thing a little bit, to help in this effort to make publishing a bit broader? Um, so what's just from each of you, maybe just one thing you would say that people can do now that will help? I think, first, I think yeah. one of the thing, one of the things is is not to see it as a a huge thing that you have to accomplish in one go, one step at a time. I mean, I always say, what is publishing? It's making public. So if you photocopy something a dozen times, you're publishing. So you have to start from where you are, what you can manage, and and not think about competing with the the huge conglomerates that are already there. You have to think, what can I do? How can I get it to the audience who I want it to? To, to, to receive this and, and, and start from there, start from where you are, one, what you can manage on your own or with, with your associates and do it that way, rather than looking at some huge unachievable goal that you can't afford to do from the beginning. Thanks, Michael. Other thoughts? One piece of advice. What I can think of is also like um, other than writers trying to, um, uh, you know, get get themselves involved in the field and try to, you know, like um, publish their work more often is um, is for the the readers to really take that responsibility. Like the more that they have to create this market for um, for um, you know understanding and reading writers of colors works and you know diversifying their taste as well. And um, I think. 
there is really like um, the potential to, to have more like a greater sense of equality and to have more representation of different kinds of writers. And I agree with Sushila, like the education is really important. It's kind of really starts the whole thing to get everyone's in, you know, more informed about the choices out there. Thanks. Emma, should say that? Um, yeah, I was going to go without uh, for the for the consumer uh, reading wider than your usual kind of to be read pile. Um, for the people within it, I guess um, holding the powers to be to account, which is is happening in a, in a small way um, after everything that happened over the summer, unfortunately. Um, the catalyst for that was another black murder, but um, you know, hopefully it, it will be sustained. Um, and for anyone looking to enter the industry, yeah, just think wider than there is so much more than just the editorial team. Um, you can be a part of, of many different departments within within the publishing industry, and um, that's kind of how we will create the change. Great, thank you, Tricia. Yeah, I mean, in terms of within publishing, it's obviously diversifying reading, expanding what you know, uh, which is difficult because obviously they're reading all the time, but also I think putting more money into marketing um, writers, they just believe in whatever their colour or background. And I think quite often the Black and Asian market gets kind of narrowed to very specific audiences and actually it shouldn't do. And I think that marketing budget is actually quite important in terms of selling books. So I think that's that's really important. And I think in terms of the writers, I think my advice would just be to have faith in what you're doing and what you're writing um, and not try and play to any trends or views of what you think you ought to be doing, but rather just write what you want to write about yourself, which is really what Jenny was saying as well, which is to write her own story regardless of how it might be perceived or how she knows it might be perceived. Yeah, I, I think it's also important to keep reading. Yeah. Yeah, and read, read outside of your comfort zone, read, read in the way that you think everybody ought to read um, insofar, as, insofar as you can. Are there things that, as we kind of move toward time, that you all are seeing that you're excited about in the industry? I suppose we've said lots of things that ought to change and things that aren't great and things challenges and struggles that we've had but are there initiatives or, or writers even that you see coming up that you, you that give you kind of cause for hope uh, I mean we, we get emails and, and Instagram messages and people contacting us on Twitter every day that are aspiring writers and that kind of um, really uh, encourages the work that we're trying to do and, and who we're trying to reach. And also speaking to, we've started going to in schools, obviously pre-COVID, before COVID, um, and talking to year 10s, year 11s, and they're like, as soon as they see, um, you know, the authors that, that, that we have coming up, they're, they're instantly kind of like hooked and, and asking questions. And, and that is, is super inspiring. And I think there is a slight shift in, in the younger generation and um, hopefully that continues. Are there causes for hope, excitement? I think it's, what's well, one thing that's very exciting is that the sort of sediment of all the activism and all the independent publishing houses, all the individuals, and, and there are many individuals obviously who are not on this panel like Khadija Sese and Me Parks and lots and lots and lots of people and agents who've been working at this for many, many years. The fact that things have changed, that we have, you know, Margaret chairing the Booker Prize, we have, you know, all these reading lists being topped by black writers for whatever reason, good, you know, whether it's for the right reasons or not, um, I just think that is great that it's happened and it is something to be very excited and proud about. I think it's also encouraging to, to, to realise that there are publishers who have always done the right thing and you know, they may not have that many uh, black or Asian or, or, or you know, their workforce may not be as, as broad as we would like it to be or they would like it to be, but they still recognize quality in, in the writers they take on and, and win prizes and so on. So it's not just every publisher 
his, who's having to make changes. There are certain publishers who are now, I suppose one can go back to that pr phrase of Ngugi, is decolonizing their minds, perhaps. And you know, we have to hope that that's something that will be sustained. And just as in the demonstrations, it, it's encouraging to see that there are a lot of people who are supporting the Black Lives Matter movement who wouldn't necessarily have been doing so, you know, some time back. So I, I think people's eyes are being opened in a way that I think is an encouraging thing to see. Okay, thank you. Jennifer, the last word? Um. I think it's really, I agree, it's like, it's quite a hopeful scene. And um, I think it's also a trial and error thing. It's like, um, it doesn't mean that we have to be right every time in making the choice of choosing those writers or, pub, uh, you know, publications and so on. Like, I hope that there will be more resources, like, and everybody is really just kind of willing, like there's a willingness to, to sort of, um, um, spend time reading and, and teaching and also like, um, um, understanding these writers um, and to kind of broaden the range. Thank you. Um, between 2009 and 2019, the London Review of Books published 105 articles by 39 different poetry critics, and all 39 were white. Those 105 articles reviewed 127 different books, and all 127 were by white poets. That is the context of this conversation. There is no question that there's still an incredible amount of work to be done, um, but our four sort of guest panelists have all found their way to break through into what's often a resistant industry. And their advice, of course, is to, to keep going. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank Emma, Margaret, Shashila, Jennifer for, for sharing their thoughts, Jennifer for sharing your work. Um, around this naughty issue of decolonizing the publishing industry. These conversations have been going on for a long time, um, but change has been made and change continues to be made, not least by the individuals sort of represented on your screen. I think we can't clap all together because strange things happen on Zoom when you try to do that. <laughs> um, so uh, clap in your own sort of silent and muted ways in your various different homes. Um, thank you for spending the last 90 minutes, uh, the last 90 minutes with us. And, and I do very much hope that you took something from the conversation that's, that's helpful to you in the various areas where, where you're working, where you're thinking, um, and, and so on. I just wanted to say um, on behalf of, of us at Wasa Theory, um, uh, a huge thank you to the organizers of this event, um, uh, the entire festival ideas. In particular, thank you to Stephanie Amina, Kumi and Danny for doing technical support for us today, um, teaching us how to use Zoom in my case, um, and generally just being very friendly, upbeat, and delivering what is a spectacularly, has been a spectacularly complicated event um, with, with good cheer. Um, we really very much appreciate it. And, and we really very much, I think, appreciate you, you creating space for these kinds of conversations, which can, must, and, and will, will continue. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening um, and we very much hope to see you soon. Take care. Thanks, Malachi. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Malachi. Thank you. Thank you very much.